Hi, this is Shomtoli Hak. I'm the editor of Law at the Margins. Today, we're sitting with Talia Peleg, who's an associate professor of law at the CUNY School of Law and a longtime immigration expert. She, along with a group of students from CUNY Law School, just returned from Dilly, Texas. We will talk to her today a little bit about the conditions of Dilly, what are some current immigration policies that we should be aware of, and how each of us can support um, those um, issues. So Talia, um, welcome to the program. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Why don't we start with a little bit about your trip to Dili. Tell us why you went, um, what was the sort of specific purpose, and maybe this what you observed there. So first of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be here with all of you today. Um, it's terrific to be here with all of you. Um, Personally, I wanted to go to Dili at this time um, when we are seeing a complete and total assault on asylum seekers by the administration and on our immigration laws. Again, this is a continuation of uh, policies that have been enacted over time, but there's a particular uh, heightened focus right now on the border. And it was really important to me as an immigration attorney, long time doing detention work here in New York, to go to the border and stand in solidarity with the women and children, refugees who have uh, come to our borders and are seeking this country's protection. And they've entrusted this country to uh, protect them in accordance with our asylum laws. I really wanted to be able to go and use my legal skills to be able to assist uh, these refugees through this process however I could. But also beyond just using uh, legal skills, I also wanted to be a warm and welcoming presence and a uh, compassionate uh, person to uh, welcome them to the United States. We were meeting at Dili um, women and children who had entered the country within about five or six days by the time we had met them. They had spent uh, days in ice boxes, which uh, many people have heard about, which after crossing the river, wet and cold, these young, young children and women are kept in uh, these extremely um, horrific conditions where they're sleeping on the floor. And many people have seen these images, freezing cold conditions, and then they're placed in cages. Um, and the way in which uh, US officials have treated uh, these women, children are, and children um, are really horrific. And um, it was you know, really critical for me to uh, be able to go and be able to try to, uh, you know, work with these women and children before they were about to go into an experience, uh, a really, really, really critical interview that they need to pass in order to be able to ask for asylum. And that interview is called the Credible Fear Interview, and it's been getting a lot of attention. Um, and this is an interview that is supposed to be sort of a low stakes uh, low standard interview that, you know, you have to pass to show that you have a, you know, strong, significant likelihood that you could ask for asylum before a judge and could potentially be granted. It's not supposed to be extremely onerous. And it's really the only way you can even ask for asylum is if you pass this interview. The administration has made this process extremely difficult and has been attempting to raise the standard repeatedly over and over again and um, seeking to deny uh, people these interviews and at which point they are deported. They cannot even ask a judge to consider their asylum claim. So I was really, really honored when a group of CUNY law students approached me um, and asked if I would join them to go to the border to address uh, these issues and to try to help these women and children through these interviews. Um, you know, our students, we, uh, you know, train our students from the be beginning, you know, really from the beginning of law school of, you know, law through doing, um, you know, experiential learning is extremely important here. And we're training students from the beginning um, and how to actually engage in legal work that can uh, create social change and um, that serves the public interest. And so, um, you know, when the students approached me about potentially joining them and, you know, explaining why CUNY law needs to be on the ground, I, I totally agreed. And we worked with the administration to create this delegation 
um, to go down. And so along with my students, we were really in the trenches, working day in and day out, interviewing women and children and preparing them first for this extremely important credible fear interview. Um, and, you know, to give you a sense of, of the situation in the legal trailer where we would meet um, women and children, it opens at 730 in the morning and it closes at 8 p.m. It's a 13 hour day and all day women and children are coming through to get a legal orientation, to get some information and to start meeting one on one with the legal advocates who are there to help them to prepare them for this critical interview. Um, so I, along with my students, along with other volunteers from around the country, were, um, you know, working through. And again, of course, many of these women and children have experienced extreme trauma on the journey along the way, not to mention the conditions that they're fleeing from their home countries. So the challenges are immense under this extreme time pressure, trying to prepare someone to uh, tell their story to a U.S. government official, an asylum officer after having experienced, again, a treacherous journey and some really, really horrific treatment by US governmental officials. So the challenges were immense, um, but it was a way for us to really go on the ground and to provide compassionate legal services and to try to help prepare these women and children to do the best they could in their interview to be allowed to pursue what is their right, which is to ask for asylum at our borders, which is allowed and permissible under the law despite the administration's attempts to, uh, to limit that right every single day. Um, yeah, so that's what we were doing there. And, and in addition to uh, preparing people for interviews, something really important to know is that we were seeing an increase of denials of these interviews, and then you have a chance to potentially appeal to a judge. And so I was able to work on several of those cases along with several of my students, and we were able to go before a judge to try to have that denial overturned. Um, and so, you know, the work was extremely important without advocates, without, you know, assistance. I, I fear many of the women and children that we were able to help would, would have uh, been sent back to their to their home countries, many of whom were fear, fearing death and severe harm should they be sent back. I wanted to go back for those who may not be familiar with um, the sort of border states um, as you're kind of giving us a little bit of visual, you know, BRI, as you're coming into this detention center, um, what are just some observations? Um, what is it like? You talked about the trailer. Um, so share a little bit about, you know, where is this place? Um, just the mood. And also as you're, as women and children are coming into the trailer, what's their mood? What's the kind of feeling at the particular place? Just so that we have a sense of really the urgency that you're talking about that you felt. Um, but if you can give, you know, give us a little bit of sense of that. So sure. Yeah. So Dilly, Texas is located about an hour and a half south of San Antonio and about an hour north of the border of Laredo, Texas. Um, where as you approach uh, Dilly, uh, you know, as you'd imagine, it becomes more and more and more desolate. Uh, you know, we flew into San Antonio and then headed south. Um, the town of Dili has a population of about 3,000, and this detention center holds 2,500 individuals. Um, on the drive to the detention center, you pass a very large uh, state jail. Uh, I believe it was a men's facility and several other correctional facilities. So really this town, um, what I could understand in my time there is really generating uh, income and livelihood off of these facilities. Um, as you approach um, what they call as a family residential center, this Dilly Center, which I, you know, call a jail, a jail for women and children, a, a baby jail. Um, as you approach, there's no signage to say that this is, in fact, the center. Right. So we had to kind of figure it out. It's not marked in any way. And as you approach, it's sort of a series of tents. Um, that's the best way I can describe it, uh, that you can kind of see. And it's, you know, lit up sort of like this, you know, invented city, right? This complex. Um, legal uh, volunteers are not allowed. We basically can go to the visitation, you know, enter through security. And then we enter directly into the legal trailer, um, which is, you know, sort of a large, you know, you know, fake structure, sort of like a, it feels like you're in a room, but it's really, it really is a trailer. 
Um, and the women and children have to enter from one entrance and we enter from another. So we were not ever allowed to see the rest of the facility. My understanding is that the director of the Dili Pro Bono Project, who we volunteered through ha with, has seen some of the rest of the facility. But my understanding is the rest of the staff and volunteers have not. Um, in terms of, you know, mood and walking in. So I'm really glad you asked that. When you walk, we walked into the legal trailer all day there's charlas going on, which are sort of like um, explanations of the Ipsalam process that we volunteers were doing, kind of legal orientations. And all day, women and children are coming in from 7.30 in the morning till eight to hear these orientations and then begin working with their advocate one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the sense when you walked in the room, seeing so many women and children waiting for some sort of guidance, for someone to speak to them to explain what is going on, um, it, it's really uh, baffling. And it's, it's really uh, heartbreaking. It's hard to really put into words. Um, many of the children and women are extremely sick. I mean, everyone was coughing, sneezing. There was a sense of, you know, just illness in the room, given the conditions that they've been held in for days. Like I had said, in ice boxes, in cages. Some, uh, by the time we were there, uh, less so, but some women had been separated from their children um, in these these conditions where they were held. So there was a real sense of uh, fear, of panic, of illness, um, and it was you know really really challenging and and um, to to watch and to be a part of. Um, and so when you would start meeting one on one with a client, what I would really try to do, you know, right away is really just try to like you know, build whatever connection I could. But of course, the, the circumstances are, are not ideal. We were doing sort of emergency legal services in an emergency situation. Sometimes you would have to do consultations. We would have a little table, but sort of in the public area. And you can imagine so many of these individuals were fleeing horrific death threats. I had clients whose homes were shot up. I have clients who had been sexually assaulted and abused. And they'd have to speak about this in a semi-public area. And, um, you know, it, it was just, it was heart-wrenching um, and absolutely not necessary. Um, you know, people do not need to be held in custody to go forward on these civil proceedings. These are civil proceedings, just like an eviction proceeding, just like any other civil matter. This immigration is a civil system and putting people in these detention centers, these jails makes absolutely no sense. Um, and you know, just operating in that environment was extremely challenging um, emotionally, as well as it really inhibited. It was very difficult to do the work we needed to do to prepare them for this for, for this interview, given the trauma and the circumstances. And also, by the way, I want to mention this is run by Core Civic. ICE in, ICE uh, contracts with and hires uh, Core Civic, which is a private entity, to run the facility. So there are Core Civic officers everywhere. Uh, patrolling throughout, even though this is a legal trailer and our com our conversations are intended to be confidential, you have to be extremely aware of all of the dynamics. And there's also ICE officials walking around. So the dynamics are extremely complex and difficult, um, but that's to give you a little picture of what it was like. What's different now? What, what, what makes this uh, particularly egregious? Um, because detention has been occurring before, um, just to sort of give us a little bit of context. Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. So the standard itself has not been changed. However, the administration has been repeatedly issuing uh, decisions in different fora and different ways of trying to make the ability to um, put forward an asylum claim under the law. They've been trying to limit the ways in which someone can qualify for asylum, trying to chip away in different categories of individuals that could qualify. But the way in which they're doing this um, often is um, they're doing it in, in, in sort of like, so the attorney general, for example, attorney former attorney general Jeff Sessions took it upon himself to uh, review a case from the Board of Immigration Appeals, which is very, uh, it's called certification. It's a very uncommon practice. This administration has done this, engaged in this process more than any administration I, I know of, or even in the last several decades um, to try to say that, uh, and, and issued a decision to try to say that individuals fleeing domestic violence, for example, um, you know, 
should not qualify for asylum. However, that decision is very, very limited, actually, in what it in fact says. It denies, it says that one specific group, a formulation of a particular social group um, was rejected, but it does not mean that anyone who's fleeing domestic violence or who um, that's the factual circumstance for why they're seeking protection cannot ask for asylum. And much of the language in the decision is dicta, meaning it's not binding, right? It's not binding on these officers. They don't need to follow it. But what's happening is engaging in and by issuing these kinds of decisions, um, officers and many other people feel, um, you know, are, are, are more likely to, um, you know, d- not pass someone at this initial stage because of those kinds of decisions. So we're seeing uh, one way in which we're seeing a change are sort of the attorney general speaking on issues and issuing decisions um, on issues that were well settled law um, that were not even at issue, but sort of taking decisions and sort of changing them. It was well established that domestic violence was a protected group, for example. Um, But in addition to, so the standard, they haven't actually formally changed the credible fear standard. It still is a significant possibility that you could win asylum ultimately. But what we're seeing are, additional policies to sort of bar individuals from even asking for asylum. For example, we just saw yesterday, two days ago, the Supreme Court allowed to go into effect a policy that the administration put forward to say that if you pass through a third country to come to the United States to ask for asylum, you should be barred from asking for asylum. Now, there's a lot of indication that this is in violation of the law, of the Immigration and Nationality Act, of many other principles. And this is a case that's going on in in another court. But the Supreme Court is allowing this ban to go forward, meaning that we're going to see, and we are seeing it in Dili since we've left, we've seen many women who are now being denied this initial stage, this credible fear stage because of this ban and bar um, to asylum that's been added and sort of created by the administration. And there's been multiple efforts at limiting um, who can ask for asylum. So the categories that are protected, we've seen multiple efforts to do that. And then also adding these sort of bans and bars to asking for asylum, which is leading officers to deny the credible fear interviews, this sort of initial stage interview. So there's a lot of dynamics and a lot of policies that are sort of uh, leading to this result. And since we've left Dili, we've heard many more cases are being denied under this um, third country uh, sort of ban. And um, so that's one uh, kind of concrete way in which what what is sort of different about what's happening at the border. Great. Um, Do you have statistics on the denial rates since Trump um, and before? Yeah, I would say we were we uh, were really fortunate. Our group did incredible work. We we had a lot of success. Um, our group, uh, we at least internally have been documenting for uh, CUNY for our own purposes. Um, we we had I we don't have I don't have the exact data, but we were quite successful in the uh, cases we prepared and the appeals uh, that we worked on. Um, and Dili, the Dili Pro Bono Project generally has had a very high success rate historically. I know it's been about 90%, which is really incredible. Um, again, though, what we saw at the end of our time there, the end of our week was uh, the week we were there, they started to see more and more negatives, right? And more and more uh, appeals that had to go before go forward before a judge, like I, like I argued in one case. Um, so I think there's a real fear. It's sort of trickling down slowly. Um, But my understanding is, especially in the last I went, I got back about a month ago, I went in August of 2019, if you're watching this later, and I think more and more denials are coming through. I think the reason they've been successful there is because of this incredible advocacy work of the incredible work of the on the ground team and the volunteers working with each woman and child to really prepare them. Um, But there's another phenomenon that I think is going to lead to more denials that we started to see when we were there that I wanted to add which is um, historically my understanding from the on the ground staff is when people would arrive to uh, to the center, right? After these, you know, horrific stays in customs and border protection facilities. And then they were brought to um, this, which is an ICE facility. So it's run by a different agency, but all under the Department of Homeland Security. 
Um, so of course they're processed. There's a lot of things to get processed, to get registered into the facility and, and into the jail and a lot of things like that. What we started to see were women coming in at 7.30 in the morning and they had notices that they had asylum interviews, CFIs, credible fear interviews at eight o'clock in the morning. So literally had gotten the notice with zero preparation a day into coming into this facility. Like I said, people are extremely sick. There's, you know, the trauma of the entire experience and were expected to go to an interview within less than 24 hours of being in the facility. Historically, my understanding is that the Dili Pro Bono Project was able to ask the asylum office, you know, we haven't had a chance to even talk to this person. They just got here. Can we have 24 hours, you know, of reasonable accommodation and that they were able to sort of negotiate that. A week before we arrived or about two, that policy stopped. They would not allow anyone to ask for more time. Similarly, I worked on a case with a woman who uh, had a very concerning cognitive um, issues. And, uh, you know, I met with her for hours and she had a lot of trouble understanding what the asylum process was and other basic concepts. In addition, she had two sons who were teenagers and they similarly presented other issues. And we asked for, and historically they've asked for specific accommodations, uh, which they're entitled to. They are entitled to this. And um, for over increasingly, there's pushback to delay those interviews, to provide, you know, the sort of accommodations that they've been getting. So there's also policies that are being enacted by the asylum office, which I imagine is coming coming from higher up, although I, of course, can't speak to that, that, is, that are um, really restricting the ability of someone to be prepared for the interview. Um, and, and, you know, very unreasonably, you know, people are asking for 24 hours or, or to notify the sum officer, you may want to ask questions in this way because of this person's potential disabilities. Um, and those are being, you know, denied. And um, it's really concerning. They used to give a 30 minute orientation. The asylum office itself would give an orientation to people to understand what they're about to go through, which is different than a lawyer who's working on their behalf, right? It's the asylum office explaining the procedures. They stopped doing that the two weeks before I arrived. They now gave just a single piece of paper that was supposed to explain the process. Many of the women I worked with, you know, might not read Spanish, maybe from an indigenous community, uh, may not even speak Spanish. And the, the documents were given in Spanish and English only. Um, so there's also a, a procedurally doing everything possible, and this is what I observed, to make it extremely difficult for these women and children to pass these, you know, interviews that should really be set up to, to you know, get information, to make sure that we're allowing people to ask for asylum, to have the chance for their case to be heard when they have expressed a fear of return. And in fact, something that I think a lot of people don't know, you can only ask for asylum in the United States. That's what asylum is you have to present yourself at the border. So this idea that people, you know, should not, you know, come to the border, there's no other way to ask for asylum. It's absolutely their right. And um, these policies, procedures, decisions um, we see coming down from the administration are just a complete assault on um, our immigration system and on asylum seekers' legal right to, uh, you know, request um, protection from persecution. It also seems like these policies are completely um, trying to do away with asylum altogether. Um, so do you think that's the intention of this administration? It's hard for me to speak to the intentionality of, of the administration. Um, I can say the, the impact that, I'm, that we're seeing is that it's making it extremely difficult for people to uh, ask for what you know, asylum, which they're entitled to. So, you know, the CFI is just the first step of the process. But I want to talk about a few other things we saw on the ground in Dili that I think really demonstrate this intentionality or, or really demonstrate the impact of people being unable to seek the protection that they are entitled to under law. Um, and that's been getting more attention in the, in the media. Uh, the MPP program that the administration enacted that also has been allowed to go forward by the courts, right? The courts are not stopping these policies. And a lot of people have, you know, said and, and, and want, you know, have a, an idea or hope that the courts are going to stop this. They're not stopping this. They're allowing this to go forward. And um, what we've been seeing are people being sent back 
to Mexico and being forced to wait in Mexico for months on in border towns that are extremely dangerous. And I think that's gotten attention um, and rightfully so how dangerous the conditions are at in these towns in Mexico where migrants are being forced to wait. Um, and I worked on one case with a woman who came with her two young children and her brother, who's an adult. She was sent to Dili and he was sent to Mexico. We were able to locate him and speak with him. He slept on the floor. Um, he was homeless for weeks in Mexico um, and was told he's going to have court in October. This was in July when they entered the United States. Um, you know, facing kidnapping, extortion, extremely dangerous conditions that we know that are well documented that are happening along the Mexican border and that migrants are particularly vulnerable. Um, this program where people are being forced to wait uh, for their immigration hearings, uh, not only is is deadly, um, but also um, what we're what we're also seeing the administration do that people need to be paying attention to is building these tent courts along the border. Um, where these cases are supposedly going to be heard. So what I understand the idea is that they will be bringing people who have been staying at border towns for months in extremely dangerous conditions to these tent courts where judges will be on television screens, right? So we're, we're thinking about due process and your right to present your case. The judge is thousands of miles away. Many people, of course, when they're in these border towns in Mexico, the right to have the access to counsel is extremely limited. There are amazing advocates throughout the country trying to provide legal services and people should be supporting their work. But, you know, it's extremely difficult to provide legal services to an individual who's in a different country, who's living in these horrific conditions, right? So these 10 courts are designed, in my opinion, or the impact are clear that people are much less likely to have lawyers, right? Are much less likely to get the legal representation that they need. Um, to present their case. And the thing that's really important to remember, you're asking, you know, about are they trying to eliminate asylum? Immigration law is extremely complex. Asylum law is extremely complex. It's been equated with tax law. And we know in this country that individuals who have, you know, tax problems have many lawyers assisting them or are trying to, you know, deal with the tax system. Yet there's a concerted effort to, um, you know, I think part of the, what's the reality of these 10 courts are that people will not have lawyers and if they're stuck at the border, they're not going to have access to a crucial evidence that they need to present for their asylum case. And the law is extremely complicated to assume that someone could pro se present their asylum case while living under these conditions in Mexico without an access to an attorney is just absolutely set up to fail. And um, so I do think the result, the impact, the and, and yes, I think the intentionality is for this to happen. I mean, I think the language of the administration is clear. Um, uh, throughout the, from the campaign through the administration um, on the ways in which migrants have been spoken about by the administration is horrific. And they're enacting that through policies to um, deny people access to the country, um, which is deeply troubling. Um, well, what can we do? How could we support those who are listening, who may feel um, they want to do something. So if you can mention one or two things where people can um, provide support. Sure. So there's a few things. Um, first, go to Dilly if you can. They train lawyers and non-lawyers. They will provide you with all the training that you need to be able to do this work. They take volunteers for a week-long basis. Uh, the experience is life-altering. Um Prof deeply profound on many, many levels um, and deeply needed. So, but I understand not everyone can do that. And that's totally um, fair. If you are an attorney or a paralegal or a legal professional, they need remote assistance. Like I said, they're seeing increasing denials or seeing increasing appeals. And they had lawyers around the country and others who are working on legal briefing, helping uh, remotely through phone. They have an incredible system set up. So if you're a lawyer somewhere else, if you're a legal worker, and you want to help, get involved. They need you. You can do it remotely. Um, the other thing, and I think that people, whether you're a lawyer or not, can do, detention is happening, civil detention. Immigration jails are all over the United States. And this is a connection that we need to make. It's not an border issue. The reason that people are able to be held in these jails at the border are very much built on the fact that we have been detaining and jailing immigrants civilly 
for the ex an extreme high numbers in the, for the last two decades, right? So it's become really unfortunately a norm in our society. And we need to be, this is the root of the problem. We need to be fighting this kind of level of detention for civil issues nationwide. So wherever you are, there is likely a detention center that you might not know about in your community. 10 miles, I'm in New York City in New Jersey, 10 miles from here, you know, in an industrial park where, you know, it, there's FedEx uh, and, and other sort of, you know, warehouses. There's a, you know, there are warehouses warehousing human beings who are there for civil violations, for immigration violations. And um, I really encourage you to get involved locally on efforts to um, you know, address that to combat that. There's been a lot of movements, people, you know, protesting outside of these facilities, making them visible. But also something that you can do that I think has been incredible, and a lot of friends who are lo not lawyers, um, you can do visitation programs, right? Shy of that, you can go uh, in New Jersey. I can say if you're local here, there's an organization called First Friends where uh, you go and visit weekly with uh, immigrants. And I, you know, I've had numerous clients who that has been life-changing for them and for, I think for the volunteer. Um, I have clients who have learned English through that process, who have, you know, created lifelong relationships. And I think that's key. I think we need to be doing, uh, showing up personally. You also can do accompaniment programs and I cannot say how critical and important this is. Um, there are programs around the country to train you to be able to go, for example, on a court to a court date with someone uh, and observe the judge, observe the hearing. You can go if someone has a deportation order and they have a check-in with ICE, which is an extremely overwhelming and intimidating task where you could be deported. You can join that individual and use your body, use your privilege. Um, you know, if you have immigration status and, and that privilege or just by virtue of, you know, living in this society and being part of this country, you can show up. And I think judges, immigration judges are, are under assault by the administration. If they see you, if you're in the courtroom, if you're watching, if you're paying attention, it has an impact. I've seen it countless times on my cases. I saw it in Dilly by having volunteers there, by having people watching and showing up, you can make a huge, huge, huge difference. So I really encourage you to you know, show up in these ways physically. If you can do remote work, donate to the legal services that are being provided on the border. There are people trying to help the people who are stranded in Mexico. We need you um, desperately. So please, anything you can do, any small thing you can do makes a huge, huge difference.